Good morning. Welcome to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church for all who are gathered here and wherever you may be gathered to be with us today. We are glad you were here with us. Wasn't it amazing this past week, you know, the first day of fall and suddenly it was fall. <laughs> to everything there is a time and a season and we were reminded of that. And so we give thanks for this transition and this new time. We also just give thanks for God's presence here with us. And I hope that it is with you, whether you were a visitor here or a member and wherever you are joining us online, too, that you have a sense of God's presence here in this place as we gather together as the body of Christ. Just a few brief announcements. We're going to have parking lot striping happening finally for us to be able to help better be able to have parking spaces. That'll be on Monday and on Friday this coming week. Uh, we'll still have parking. It'll just be limited during those times. So just as a heads up for that. And then we've intentionally been able to work it in so that also on Thursday we have our time for our memorial service for, uh, for Sherry Eaton at 11 a.m. So it'll be this Thursday at 11. And then there's also a fellowship following afterwards outside in the pavilion and in the grassy area too. All are welcome to be able to be part of that memorial service as we say goodbye to this precious sister in Christ. Let's see, also we have Sunday School back next week once the break is back, but thank you to Vince for your um, ad hoc impromptu Sunday School class on worship today. That was great to be able to be a part of that. Also, um, it's a little bit early for announcement, just, but just to give a heads up, on October 17th will be our annual congregational meeting, so please do be part of that. That's for voting in the budget and for the overall items annually for our congregation, so please do stay for that. That'll be after the 11 a.m. worship on that Sunday, October 17th. Also, if you've noticed in the news, the cases are coming down for COVID. Of course, we have had more deaths that finally came after deaths that stayed at such, such a low rate for so long. They've come back up, of course, but it's always a lagging indicator. Now that cases have come down, we have every reason to expect that deaths will also follow. Hospitalization rates are already coming down too, along with the lowered cases, which is great. And I, you know, I do the number crunching here and there. The, the great part, I'll make it an even number though. The great part is if you look to the end of August versus just right here and now, we are looking in Georgia for the seven day moving average of about 5,000 fewer cases per day right now than we've had. And those cases are continuing to go down. So with that, we are gonna add one more little thing in worship, singing in praise and adoration, and that is the doxology. So after our offering today, we are going to praise God and thanksgiving from whom all blessings flow. And with that, let us stand together for our call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made.
We continue with our confession in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us the salts of your Spirit, and in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's holy word. Please join in reading responsively from Psalm 19. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More than you desire than any other more than thou shine, sweeter far than honey, than honey By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect the hearts of the masters? Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, strength in my heart. Our second reading is from the book of Numbers. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leek, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised an oath, on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they come to me weeping and say, Give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, 
Gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of, the, of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not, not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Word of God, word of life. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw one casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believes in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And this time I'd like to invite the children to come forward for a special children's message. There we go. I'll try to talk well through the mask. We are on this side today, huh? I got this side children's message. So I want to ask you if you've thought about what you might want to do or be when you grow up. Anybody have any ideas? Yeah, what do you want to do or be when you grow up? A teacher. Oh, that would be fantastic. An author. It's right. Wonderful. What do you think? Paleontologist. Wow. That would be great. Matthew? A lawyer. Wow, and we have our, our council president's a lawyer now, too. Yeah. Lots of great possibilities. When I was growing up, I wanted to be either, I wanted to either own my own business, and I eventually got to do that, but I also wanted to be a doctor. 
That's one thing I didn't do, but it was the same heart wanting to help people that also called me, even when I was working in a hospital and getting ready to take tests to maybe go into med school, that I had a whole sense of call to help people through God as pastor. And there's so many incredible dreams we can dream. And so, do you know what some of those deepest passions are? What, what, what do you think a deep, deep passion might be? It's one of those dreams that you really, what do you think? What might it Something you really, really like to do. Yes, some people really want to dance. And, and, and it, when they dance and they share those motions and movements with people, then they realize, whoops, and I'm losing this, sorry. That, that wasn't a dance. <laughs> that was just stumble. There we go. So they realize in their dancing that it's beautiful and they don't feel that way doing anything else. There's just something about dance, right, that really does something that nothing else can for them. The same could be true for art or maybe a certain person with organ or piano here too. Any number of things that this just doesn't feel that any, any way the same uh, if we were to do something else. Sometimes those deepest, deepest passions, we may think, well, I don't know if I really should do those or not. I don't, I don't know if God wants me to do that. I want all the children here, especially the older children too and the younger children here, to keep dreaming your dreams and living those passions because who made you? God, right. And so if God made you, and it's not just maybe an immediate thing you just feel like doing today, like wanting to watch TV, but if it's a deep, deep thing inside of you, doesn't that make sense that it very well might have also come from God? and the way that God has gifted you. So you don't have to worry about figuring out how it works with God's call or anything else. If it's that deep passion, just let it out. Keep dreaming those dreams and living those passions and God will do the work to make them beautiful and holy, okay? So I hope that you have those dreams happen and sometimes I've known in life too, like one of the things I dreamed about didn't happen, but it was another amazing thing. God can do amazing things and take those same dreams and passions and maybe even have a beautiful surprise that we never even thought of, of what we can do. There was a woman in the earlier service, we went ahead and had kind of the kids message with the adults. She wanted to be a rockette dancer. And you might think she's a little past that time now, potentially for her age, but in this very church, we have a group of women dancers called the Kickers. That's very similar, and she's probably still kind of young for that group. So you never know about God's plans and, God, and, and the passions God has given us. So keep dreaming, and everyone else too. Keep those dreams alive and those passions alive, and trust God to be the one to do the work and make them happen. All right, thanks so much for coming up, and have an awesome week. So this week when I had this great, um, theologically wonderful message title, Save Salt for Self-Service, I got some feedback from my minister of music, Vince, and from Pastor Bonnie. They actually independently, true story, had exactly the same theological question in response to me. What were you thinking? <laughs> true story. <laughs> so, so here's a little of, of what I was at, right? That's right, right? <laughs> so what was I thinking? I was thinking back to some of the texts and the texts that seemed to be kind of disjointed and all over the place for this week, but really, maybe there is something that comes back together for that. And maybe we start with the people in numbers. They talked about all kinds of food, so maybe some salt goes along with that. But before we go to our Israelites in numbers, uh, let's have some context with that from John eleven thirty five, 35, and it's traditionally at least known as being the shortest verse in Scripture Anybody have a sense of what that might be? Jesus. Yes, Jesus wept. It's traditionally known that way as being the shortest verse. Um, in that context, we know there was Lazarus who had just died. Martha and Mary, the sisters, were grieving, and there were Jews around who were grieving too. And when Jesus finally came, and then he came to Martha, then Mary too, and Mary was just weeping, weeping. The Jews around were weeping. Jesus gets so deeply moved, it says, that also Jesus wept. 
That makes sense for our Lord, a Lord of compassion, to be able to, to weep in the midst of that death. Even though he knew the good news that would come for Lazarus, yet he was with the people that he loved and in their grieving also grieved too. The people, the Israelites in Numbers today also grieved and, and wept. It says, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. That's a little different than dying and, and, right, and, and Jesus weeping and, and, and having all these people that are grieving. They're, they're crying over not having meat. And looking back to the time in Egypt when oh, we had fish, you know, like with no call, we just got fish for nothing. And, and, and we had, oh, the cucumbers and the melons, oh, the melons that we had and, and the onions and the garlic and, and, and all the, the leeks. We had leeks. Now all we have is this manna to stare at all the time. So, yeah, it's almost as if they had the salt shaker in their pocket, right, ready just to just add to that meat whenever it was going to come. You know, Lord, come on, give us our meat and our leeks and all this. And they're crying over it. What in the world is going on with that? When we complain and protest about those things that are exterior, those things that are beyond us, and when we don't look at ourselves at all, but look to another person or another group, we want them to change, we want them to be different, or we want them to, to bring things back the way they used to be, and we want them to fix it and fix it now. Give us our leaks like we used to have and enjoy. There's a couple of things that often happen, especially if we end up doing that complaining as, as a group, too. We can get to the point of rationalizing almost anything and believing that it is justified. That's the first thing that can go wrong. The second thing is, when we get all caught up in that, we can miss the very manna in our midst. The same Israelite people in Numbers, they were wandering in the wilderness after having been freed. They're free now from Egypt. God's been watching over them this whole time. And the irony, what they miss is, out in the wilderness, and, and for those of us who went to the Holy Land, Wilderness in the Middle East is more like desert that we would think of. There is it's great sparsity of any kind of food there. They miss that they're getting manna right in front of their eyes every single day. They're fed daily by God in the midst of this. But in their outward critical focus, God give us all, they're just thinking about other things that they've missed. Even to the point of tears over that. It may seem ridiculous, but really... People have been in this country able to rationalize all kinds of things and put it out on others and to demand things. Just this past week, I believe, I heard of a woman in Philadelphia. Did you hear about this at Chipotle? And Chipotle was going to be closing because they were short-staffed. They were going to be closing a little bit early. No. She pulls a gun out of her purse, holds them up, says, I'm hungry, feed me. Seriously, this, is, this supposedly actually happened. Uh, you could really fool me with stories now because the reality of what's happened in America in the last couple of years, you could tell me so-and-so happened and I would probably believe it, you know, because it's been so different now. I really think that in her mind, in some way, she thought, no, it's not closing time yet. I was here in line. I need service. If you're not going to do it, I'm going to hold you up. I think somewhere in her mind she felt justified pulling that gun and, and sure enough, they gave her food and she got food and left. I think they're still looking for her now. So... <laughs> So when I say that we have a propensity to potentially go way beyond what is justice that way, when we have that outward focus, we have example after example showing that. But it's also simply just part of our human nature. It goes back to, to Luke 6, 42, that, that when we have that outward focus of critic, the outward focus of blame, the outward focus of protesting over and against others without ourselves, we miss that log in our own eye as we look to the speck in our neighbor's eyes, and it gets it really warped how we see whatever it is, even if the first issue began with something that seemed to be justice. Now, I'm not saying that this is a universal thing. This is particular to today's sermon, particular to this message. There are times when it makes sense to have that outward focus and yes to protest without that we may not have had women's suffrage to come when it did we may not have had civil rights and equal opportunity and various things to happen so this is not a universal always and forever sermon in this way but it is to acknowledge that much of the time because of our human nature when we simply try to change others and don't work on ourselves how does that go 
And, and what if all of the world was that way? If we say, if we're going to be this way, what if everyone else is this way too? And all of us looked to an external change and blaming others while doing nothing for ourselves. Would the world be a better place or a worse place than it is now? In the gospel today, Jesus looks to talk with the disciples in response to what John had said. John is looking to do that external change, right? Look, they're trying to cast out demons in your name, and they're not one of us. Is John doing some internal reflection of that, remembering what Jesus had taught him about, you know, to go out and to be able to heal in my name? And it could have been inspirational change for John. But no, he unintentionally kind of messes things up by trying to make this whole external change this way. So, and, and some, some kind of fun ways of looking at this. Um, Let's just have a couple of examples just to, just to throw around here to, to get kind of the picture. Who do you think is the, the worst driver for driving cars? Who, who thinks women are the worst drivers out there? We got no guys raising their hands at all except for Matthew. Or their little Matt, he's bold. We had one guy in the first service. Then I asked the next question. I said, and who believes that men are the worst drivers? And, and his wife then raised her hand. <laughs> So who thinks men are the worst drivers? Anybody here? How about, yeah, there's one. How about young teen drivers? My daughter just, she's raising her hand a little bit. <laughs> but she's doing really well. Lauren, you're doing really good to start out. What about um, senior citizen drivers? Are they the worst drivers? Maybe, maybe something. Do you know who I think are the worst drivers of all? Backseat drivers. The ones with no skin in the game, who aren't up there to begin with, they have no authority or responsibility what to do, but they would love to share regardless of what was done wrong and what should have been different, right? Total outward focus, no self-focus at all. That's who I think are the worst drivers. And what about quarterbacks? Is the worst quarterback the one with the lowest completion percentage? I actually don't think so. I, and it could be the one maybe with the, um, the worst touchdown to interception ratio, Actually, I think the worst one is the Monday morning quarterback, right? <laughs> the one who literally has no pigskin in the game at all, who wasn't part of that battle to begin with, but has all kinds of opinions about what they think should have happened outwardly with others. Are you, are you seeing how this kind of works and fits in? And so this is exactly also what the disciples were doing. You know, John comes to Jesus, oh, we saw this person trying to do this in your name, and they're not one of us, so we, we try to stop them. Total outward focus without any self-reflection or any possibility of change within oneself. And I think that's where things kind of start to come together for the gospel that seems so disjointed in the scriptures today. Because when we look back in Numbers, we see the same thing, right? Give us our leeks and our onions now. Bring it back to where it was. Make it different. Change it for us. Missing the very manna in their midst. Or maybe even holding somebody at gunpoint. Give me my onions now and my garlic, Chipotle. Or whatever it is that was being demanded without even any self-reflection. And I think it kind of comes together then when we are looking and we hear this radical, tough gospel about, you know, the hands and feet being cut off. It would be better off that. Than, but then when we look back and we realize... Well, the way the gospel started is with the disciples having this outward focus. And then Jesus' very first next example say, says also with this kind of outward focus, if you cause even one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for millstone around your neck. A lot of times, even if we think we're doing the right things, the disciples thought they were doing the right things to correct these people from casting out demons in Jesus' name for doing good in Jesus' name. Sometimes we just are misled and we can do more harm than good by having that outward critical focus while being oblivious to ourselves. I think this is what Jesus was talking about. And this is why it'd be even better if we had a millstone around our neck than to do that to one of the least beautiful children of God. And this is where we get in with the foot and the hand and the eye to even tear it out if it causes you to sin in this way. But then I think it all comes together with verse 50, where Jesus says, salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? And then Jesus says, 
this next part, which I think brings it all together. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And I think that's the gist of it. If we want to have change and transformation in this world, let it begin with me. Let us say, here I am, Lord, send me, as we heard about even in the Sunday school class today, too. Let that be our beginning point, not why don't you do whatever it is differently, but begin within with us. There was a, um, a family that I came across on Friday. I was um, over at the Atlanta Premium Outlets just off of I-575. It was a young African-American family with a dad and a mom and three little girls, and they were posing for a picture there because they had an outdoor setting of uh, bales of hay and a bunch of pumpkins and I think like a little scarecrow up top and dad was about to take the picture and of course for me you know we, we go to Disney and the national parks and and so it's kind of common for me to go up and just want to have because usually the person taking the picture doesn't get in the picture unless somebody's swapping around so I asked if he wanted to to get in the picture of course this is not Disney though or national parks and people aren't usually taking pictures at the premium outlets <laughs> So he looked a little funny with me at first, but I was like, okay, all right, well, you know, so he gets in for the picture, take a couple of pictures, and how do you like that? And he loves the picture. Oh, that was so nice. Thank you so much. And I looked back, and for the first time, I saw his shirt and his wife's shirt. And on the shirts, there were T-shirts. And one shirt had the word unity, and the other shirt had the words be kind. And I just kind of looked down and looked back up and, and gave him a little more of a smile, and he gave me a little more of a smile too. And I know I'm inferring with this, but I believe we were just affirming each other and saying yes to this, to, to have unity and, and to be kind to each other. And I think, I think when we have salt more in ourselves and to let that passion come out from within rather than trying to make it outward focused, it, it helps to be able to have, as Jesus said, more peace with each other when we do that. And I do believe it helps us also to be a little more kind and to have more unity as well. So let's have that saltiness in ourselves, but saltiness not for doing the Monday morning quarterbacking, but rather for bringing out those God-given, Spirit-given passions, the ones deep within ourselves, and to bring them out positively in spirit-led ways that we might, yes, be more at peace then with each other as we are working on ourselves. And yes, bring a little more kindness and unity into the world. For me, I'm going to be focused a little more on the environment. That's a passion for me. That's something that I've thought of. Even as a young adult in college, I was involved with things for the environment. But I've, I've noticed that I've been a little bit, I haven't said this, so this is out for the first time now to say, but I've been inwardly critical um, of hearing about all the Green New Deal stuff and other things like that, where it's all this money to be spent on either government programs or companies having restrictions, but none, I keep, I keep listening for it, I keep listening, and none that I hear about personal responsibility of what we can do as citizens to help be part of that change. We have 331 million of us. Imagine if there were some specific, specific things, maybe even some tax incentives to help us change our behavior, do something different. So I was looking for something different we could do, but never heard that. So you know what I did? I was kind of Monday morning quarterbacking. I was getting kind of critical of hearing about that inwardly, but you know what I was doing different? Nothing. So I'm going to try to... Um, live my own sermon I'm preaching, and rather than being inwardly critical of hearing that just gap where there's no personal responsibility, there's no personal stuff, to, maybe I can do something a little more. So if you know about farmer's markets with organic food, I've not really done more than a couple of those in my life. I think I want to do a little more of those for our environment, and I want to also look beyond uh, my own home for recycling, whether it's even on the side of the road or where, but I want to try to find some more things too that I can recycle. Now, is that going to make the difference in the world and change everything? No. Although I like what Leslie's saying. She's saying, yes, it will. <laughs> and, and for you guys, too, what, what will you find maybe to have more salt in yourselves and to bring out some of that passion inwardly in a way that could make a difference? Those little small things, they may not change the world in and of themselves, but with God in the midst of them, maybe so. 
Maybe it's just a seed, but God is the author who makes the seed into the harvest. God is the one, as we heard about in this first hymn, too, that brings this light and life and grace into being. He is the source of this light, light and grace, who changes and turns graves into gardens. So even these little things we might do, it is because of God's grace, not our small actions, that God can do a wonderful and great thing. So have salt in yourselves and keep dreaming those dreams with how God has deeply made you to be. Don't give up on them and let them come out positively with the Spirit guiding and leading. And let's see where God takes us and how beautiful it can be. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for giving us that salt, that passion, that grit, that desire for transformation. May it be from within for us, for your spirit to work in us and through us, to live out those passions and dreams as your spirit would lead us and guide us, that we might also then be at peace with each other. And through your spirit guiding us, may we also have a little more kindness and a little more unity in your holy name. Amen. We join our voices together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. We pray for your church and its ministry. Bless the newly baptized and encourage them in their journey of faith. Sustain all members of the body of Christ in lives of prayer, service, and worship. Lord, in your mercy. 
We pray for natural wonders of your creation. Restore damaged forests, waterways, and natural habitats, and lead us to be good stewards of what you have provided. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those in authority. Give them wise minds and compassionate hearts. Strengthen in them a desire to protect the vulnerable and care for those underserved. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those who are struggling with cancer, dementia, or any other disease. Provide them and their caregivers with peace and resilience for the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, we ask your spirit to transform our hearts and minds so that we may faithfully live out your mission. Help us to have salt in ourselves and foster peace with others. Lord, in your mercy, Hear, O Lord, the prayers of your people, which we offer before you now, both spoken aloud and from the silence of our hearts. We pray for our Jewish brothers and sisters that they may be shown love and respect and kindness. We pray for Daryl, Betty, Lee, Mary, Russ, Jim and Susie, Misty, Matthew and Shelley, and all those on our prayer list. We pray for all who are grieving today. Lord, in your mercy, we give thanks for all your saints, those we have loved and known, and those from every time and place. Continue to guide us by their example and reassure us of your promised salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share a word of peace. Peace. <laughs> we continue now with our offering. God has been so incredibly generous with us, and now we pause to give back a portion of what God has first given us.
Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All who hunger for God's love and mercy are welcome to this feast of grace. You may be seated.
Please stand if you can. May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you, heal you, and hold you in his grace. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make the journey with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you now. The one who made us, who loves us, and travels with us. Amen. to love and serve the Lord. Thanks.